You're watching Teaching Your Registrar About Best Practice Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health. Produced by GP Supervision Australia and presented by Dr. Karen Nichols and Dr. Simon Morgan. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this recording was produced and pay our respects to their elders past, present, future and their families. Fabulous to have everyone on for a second part in the series on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. And I guess for our supervisor members, most importantly, how you can, in your role, best teach this incredibly important aspect of practice to your registrars. Karen, for many of you, doesn't need much introduction. She is a very prominent Indigenous GP who's been doing uh, clinical and academic work for many, many years. And I'd also like to count her as a very good friend. And she's um, a very impressive person. Karen, I would very much like to welcome you to do an acknowledgement of the country and to take things away. Thank you, Simon. And as is my cultural protocol, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Waramai Nation and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And acknowledge their ongoing connection to the lands, waterways and skies and that sovereignty was never ceded. And an acknowledgement of country is extremely important for numerous reasons and I'm hoping that's something that you've all researched and are aware of the importance of acknowledgement of country. So the objective is to prepare your registrar to deliver best practice clinical and cultural care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Just so that you're aware that there are some teaching plans on the GPSA website that have been developed to help deliver teaching to your registrars. And as you all know, to be able to teach our registrars, we also have to upskill. So I'm hoping that there will be some new information for some of you as well, so that you're able to best support your registrar with the learnings for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health. So what we covered was around the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, about 50 to 60% don't utilise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander specific general practice services. So they would be the community controlled services. So about 50% attend what we call mainstream general practice. As general practice supervisors, we need to be able to teach this topic to our registrars who look to us to provide them that knowledge. We've also covered the cultural context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. So who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? We've touched on some of the history in terms of how it's had an impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health today. So history is actually really, really relevant. We talked about cultural awareness and cultural safety, and we also talked about First Nations concept of health and well-being being that social and emotional well-being, holistic model of health. So not just the absence of disease, it is also around the health of family, community, environment, as well as the political environment, social environment, and what we call the cultural determinants of health. We also covered what is appropriate language when referring to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So not using acronyms, using words like First Nations is appropriate. Younger generations tend to be more accepting of that. Older generations may not. Even referring to people from the language group or the nation that they belong to is appropriate. When we talk about holistic model of health for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we talked about it as being the connection to the body, mind, emotions, family and kinship, connection to country, connection to culture, connection to community, and connection to spirit and spirituality, as well as our connection to ancestors. And the cultural determinants of health we talked about, so connection to country, kinship, knowledge and beliefs, language, self-determination and cultural expression. We also did a bit of a revision on what the social determinants of health are, so around housing, law and justice, poverty, food security, but also including racism. Racism is seen as a social determinant of health. And then some of the clinical context and talked about how important it is to understand the statistics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, not necessarily to compare to non-Indigenous communities because the starting point is different but 
that we talked about understanding where the health needs are greatest. Treatment protocols might be different. Preventative care we talked a little bit about and we talked about the risk assessment tools and how many of them aren't culturally validated. So we need to be careful about use of those with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. And I think the important thing to take away from the clinical context is indigeneity is not a risk factor for health. We use indigeneity as a surrogate marker of the impact of the social determinants of health. The only thing that indigeneity is a risk factor for is racism, but it, we use it as a surrogate marker as to what the impact of the social determinants of health are on our patients. Towards the end, I talked about the consultation briefly. I do want to expand on it just a little bit. So this diagram comes from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health in General Practice. This is a guide that's been developed by GPSA and it's actually a really quite a useful guide and they've broken down Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health into these four areas. I just want to focus on consultation just really briefly. We did talk about these with consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, how nonverbal communication is important. So being mindful of your body language is really important. The yarn, and I'm going to go into the yarn just a little bit more because I think that's actually a really potentially useful tool for you to be able to teach your registrar. And I'll give a couple of examples as to why. We talk about longer appointments, appropriate decision makers, so making sure the people who should be there at the consultation are there and the patient is given the opportunity to let you know. The use of silence and silence does not mean that the patient doesn't have a question or doesn't have a response or doesn't know. It just means silence and they may actually be formulating what they want to ask or how they want to respond. That yes can sometimes just be a word that's used to end things so that patients don't have to continue engaging in the service or with the service provider, and that the benefit of open-ended questions cannot be underestimated. Direct questions are not advisable just because it can feel quite interrogative for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, especially who are, find themselves in positions where there's power imbalance, such as a consultation. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the yarn. So this is something that I think you could use with your registrar. It is a tool that is based a bit on the Calgary-Cambridge framework for consultation, but this has been sort of adapted for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The body of evidence of it isn't extensive, but there's lots of anecdotal evidence around it. And if you speak to a lot of people who work in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, they use these techniques really quite successfully. And we have three stages of the clinical yarn, the social yarn, the diagnostic yarn, and the management yarn. And the social yarn is there to build rapport and trust. It might be that you are having just a chat, you know, a general chat with the patient. And this is what I start to talk about, the two-way sharing. It's where you start to talk about something that is of interest to the patient. You find something where you have something in common with the patient. And I'll give an example of that and I will do it. It's in the academic field and it's to do with a student who was interviewing an Aboriginal patient in hospital and they were finding it really difficult. They felt that they weren't building the rapport with the patient as they should be because the patient was just using, you know, yes or no to answer questions and wasn't very engaged. Their body language wasn't that of someone who was interested in being interviewed by the student. So the student then decided to introduce themselves again. And they said, look, let me tell you a little bit about myself. They talked about where they were from. They talked about when they moved to the area and how long they'd been in the area. And then they talked about their religion. They talked about the fact that they were, you know, Muslim. And I mentioned that because the student said after they had mentioned that, the patient said, oh, I've got a couple of Muslim friends. And then from there... The patient asked a little bit more about the student, shared information about their friends who are Muslim, and that was the common ground that the patient had with the student. And from there, that, the student was able to then go on to the diagnostic yarn. And the diagnostic yarn 
is where you obtain your clinical information. And remembering that the use of open-ended questions is really important. Silence is your friend. So using silence as a communication tool, which I think as GPs, we're probably pretty good at anyway. And monitoring your nonverbal language. So if you're checking your watch for the mess, if you've got a smart watch and you're checking your watch as you're reading your texts, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients pick up on that and interpret that as you, one, not being interested and actually a little bit disrespectful. So the diagnostic yarn is actually really important where we get a lot of our clinical information. Um, and then you go on to the management yarn. And the importance of the management yarn is that you are sharing the information with the patient to what you think is going on, what you think needs to be done to investigate, and what the options are. And the management yarn, it's really important to remember to offer what all the options are for a patient. So I'll give you another example. And this is someone I spoke to last week who was talking about when they saw their GP and the GP had diagnosed them with type 2 diabetes. The GP had actually said, this is your treatment for diabetes. This is what you need to take. And the patient said to the doctor, hang on, what are my other options? How can, what can I do to get rid of the diabetes? So, I mean, one, the education wasn't entirely there for the patient, but the doctor didn't explore what the patient's expectations were as well and didn't offer them advice on lifestyle management for type 2 diabetes either. So the patient left quite unsatisfied with the consultation and with the doctor's management and that, that erodes trust. Definitely teaching your registrar to be patient-centred is really important. But I think, you know, thinking about the consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients in terms of a clinical yarn, and it's more conversational rather than, you know, having your checklist of symptoms that you need to elicit, yeah, is far more conversational. There's a lot of narrative that can occur. You just have to see where the conversation goes and often you will get that information that you need. And even if you um, say to a patient, let's just have a yarn, you know, why yeah. want to have a yarn with you? Why are you here today? You know, patients know what that means. And I've listed there a couple of resources. So one is on the wards, which is an education resource that a lot of RMOs use. And there's a fantastic conversation between three Aboriginal doctors with regards to communication with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients. The other one is WA, it's the rural health, and they've got a whole learning module on clinical yarn, which I think is really, really useful. It, it takes probably about two hours to go through. So I think that's something really useful to direct your registrar to. And it's free. So they don't, they just have to sign up for it. There's no cost involved. When they talk about that. Yeah. So you talked about the value, the importance of maybe describing a bit about yourself and your background. A specific question that I've always been unsure about, how acceptable is it for a non- Indigenous person like myself to talk about my country or yep. you know the the place I connect with is that respectful or, or yep. not yep totally yeah totally yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so if it's somewhere in Australia you know that's fine you know I'm you know I was born here I was raised over here and this is where I feel yep. that you know most at home if it's overseas again it's a, mm -hmm. a way to start a conversation but share something about yourself. Yeah. As I said in the first webinar, only share something that you're prepared to be out in the public domain because whilst we have to maintain confidentiality, patients don't have to. So, you know, I think it's just yeah. make sure it's something you're comfortable to share. Yeah. Solange was saying she's always been in the habit of, of offering an Aboriginal liaison officer, which I think is really good practice. But finally a patient said, yeah, that sounds good. And she went, oh, I don't know where to go. Texas one so <laughs> she was wondering about the PHN and and I would suggest the PHNs actually yeah. and then the other option would be a community health centre so if your state government has a community health centre there's sometimes Aboriginal health units attached to those and they they may actually be able to support as well yeah but definitely don't offer something if you can't provide it all right, so that was my not so brief talk about communication. So I do apologize for that. So I want to talk about context. And with this, I'm going to talk about cover identification, some Indigenous specific services, bearing in mind that these will change 
depending on your location. Some of the Medicare items and what additional supports may be available for your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and patients. I would definitely encourage you to see what is available in your local area. So I guess my first question is, how many people ask the identifying question regularly and do you know what it is? I remember, Karen, and I'm sure you'll speak to this, you know, just getting over that hump of making it routine such that it became so routine that I don't even think about it, but I do it and certainly try to populate the clinical record when it's, when it's absent. I think that's a really nice prompt to do it. So occasionally, yes, only during health assessments regularly. So thanks for those who are being more honest because, yeah, it is such an important aspect, but it's not always done. Yeah. And so remembering that there is specific wording when you're asking the identifying question and that there's the request that the wording not be changed. So it is, are you of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander origin with the four options? Remembering that some people identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. This is best practice. So definitely something to practice doing with every patient. And if you do it with every patient, then at least when someone questions why you're asking, you can say that it is something that you do for every patient. I will just say, yes, patients can fill in a registration form. The reception staff can ask, the nurse can ask, but they may not actually feel comfortable identifying to the practice nurse they may not feel comfortable presenting to the reception staff they may not feel comfortable ticking that box on the form if you've developed rapport with the patient they may only feel comfortable disclosing with you usually you know I've not had a patient object to me updating their file when they've disclosed to me and no one else I think it's important to ask you cannot rely on previous forms or previous people having identified the patient my next question is around what are the reasons we ask the identifying question? So what purpose does it serve? So I've got some different responses, access to the variety of services that are available and clinical aspects like immunisation to be able to navigate the consultation. So I guess that may be for many reasons, clinical, cultural, other reasons, building rapport, get to know the patient a bit better. So there's some responses. So understanding why is actually really important because you need to be able to explain that to your registrar. And it is so that we can tailor healthcare to the needs of individuals and tailoring also means that we can refer people to services that are designed specifically for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people that increases cultural safety. Being quite clear that, you know, it is about cultural safety. It's being able to collect, and not that I would share this with patients, but it's also being able to collect data around, you know, closing the gap and closing the gap initiatives. And it's also so that if there is an increase in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in a particular area, it helps with determining funding as well. So, you know, there might be a need for greater services designed for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that wasn't there 10 years ago. So I think it's actually really, really important. Remembering that Aboriginality, so indigeneity is not a disease, but it is used as a surrogate marker for the social determinants of health that may contribute to poor health with your patient. The other thing, you know, with regards to the identifying question is that it's also really important to ask people, if people say no, ask them again, just because if they have not got a level of trust with your service, but then over time you develop rapport and they become more trusting, they might feel comfortable identifying to you. So we'll just talk quickly about the... 715. So the 715 is a health assessment. Health assessment is important as preventive health. It helps identify contributors to developing chronic disease for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And it should be based around the holistic model of health for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and it also it will allow for early intervention. So I'm hoping that many of you are aware of the National Guide to a Preventive health assessment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that will be updated 
at the end of this year. So I think that next edition, I think it's the fourth edition, should be released in October. There are a couple of new topics in the next edition, which I'm very excited about. So definitely keep your eyes open for that. The benefit of the health assessment is that you can get a lot of useful information about your patient if it is done well as a consumer of health services, not only as, you know, someone who provides care to people, but as a consumer, I have had health assessments that have been done exceptionally well. And I've had health assessments that have just felt like they've been a tick box exercise and just a way in which the organisation is getting remuneration. It is important to find out what the priorities are for the patient with regards to their health and what they would like to address in the next sort of nine to 12 months, remembering that health assessments can be done at a minimum of nine months if need be. It also allows access to an additional five allied health appointments in the calendar year. So that's in addition to what might be available for the GPMP and TCA if the patient has a chronic disease. Plus, there is an item number that is available for the practice nurse or an Aboriginal health worker to follow up on that health assessment. And that allows 10 follow-up visits by a practice nurse or Aboriginal health worker. So let's say the patient identified that they wanted weight loss as their goal, then why not have the nurse check in and do the support for the patient or the Aboriginal health worker? Now, I do acknowledge that there's always time constraints, but you know, in terms of delivering what would be considered best practice care, that is an opportunity. If a patient has slightly elevated blood pressure and you want them to come back, well, there's no reason why they can't see the nurse and that item number be billed if a health assessment is up to date. Health assessment should definitely be done by the regular GP. If it can't be done by the regular GP, then definitely the regular practice, but it works better if it's the GP that knows the patient. So do not do a health assessment on a patient who is not a regular of your service. You can collect the information over multiple visits. There's no need to set aside an hour and a half or two hours of the patient's time in one day. If you see the patient regularly enough, it can be done over multiple visits. And then depending on what other services are available in your area, sometimes a health assessment is needed to be able to access additional supports. And if it's done well, patients really do like them. It's also an opportunity to engage in a strengths-based approach to health, meaning that the things that people are doing really well, let them know they're doing really well. We want them to do more of the good stuff. And it also helps with engaging patients in decision-making for their care and to explore things such as the impact of intergenerational trauma or any other traumatic experience in life that can affect health and lead to poor health outcomes. Uh, that's a question about item numbers, which mm. for follow-up visits, I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, but maybe something. So 10987 is the practice nurse, Aboriginal health worker, practitioner yeah. number. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that it is an avenue potentially for exploring and managing a whole raft of underpinning issues, because I think on the one hand, registrars and indeed supervisors may find embarking on a health assessment quite a daunting task because you know potentially do uncover quite a lot of really important aspects of care that need addressing and then I'm also glad you mentioned the flip side which is this I think we've all been aware of 715s being done in a very cursory manner and really disrespectfully to the patient so I guess that's more a comment than anything but I guess perhaps how would you encourage a registrar who is daunted by, you know, the potential scope of issues that they're uncovering and they feel a bit sort of at sea anyway. So I think the good thing about the health assessment is finding out what the patient goal is, being patient-centred, so long as it's not an urgent issue, being patient-centred is really important. And the other thing to reassure registrars is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know that it's complex. They appreciate it. And, you know, I had this lovely patient who said to me one day, you know, Karen, we're not going to fix this in one visit. So just bearing in mind, what is it we need to focus on today? 
there anything urgent that needs to be followed up on? If there's not, then what are your priorities as a patient and how does that match what my priorities are as a clinician? And then negotiate from there, yeah. And you may uncover the trauma and patients may just say, look, I don't want to go there. And that's okay, yeah. But at least you know that that is something that is impacting their life, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. There's a national guide there. Fourth edition is coming out in October. And the other thing is the National Guide is a partnership between RACGP and NACHA, which is the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. So it's a national body. The Preventive Guide is a partnership between RACGP and NACHO. These are pro formas that they develop. So they're age specific, just so that to make sure that doctors are covering what needs to be covered and try to make it something a little bit more useful, but there may be different pro formas on your electronic record keeping system. I actually quite like these because I was a little bit old school and like to write them as patients spoke. And it just meant that I was a little bit more engaged with patients rather than sitting at a computer typing. But if you have a health worker or if you have a nurse who's very good at this stuff and it is worthwhile training up some staff members to be good at doing all this initial stuff, you'll find that they do a lot of that hard work for you and they will do a lot of referrals and recommendations and patient education as well. Just to show you the, the rest of the pages of the health assessment for the 12 to 24-year-olds. The practice incentive program is another thing that you might want to talk to your registrar about. It has been designed, and I remember when this came in because it was 2010, that's actually when I got my fellowship. And I remember doing my first lot of training to GPs on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health then. It is designed to improve health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and encourage practices to prevent, identify and manage chronic disease. So it encourages health services to meet the health care needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with chronic disease and health services, including general practices, AMSs, so Aboriginal medical services, Aboriginal community control health services as well. Again, it must be the usual care provider that signs the patient up to the practice. So it must be their usual practice as well. What are the benefits? Well, there's financial remuneration for practices, opportunity to develop further knowledge in Indigenous health because of some of the requirements that you need to do in terms of being able to sign up initially, and also contributing to closing the gap because under the PIP, to qualify for the payment, you have to see the patient um, a certain number of times in a year. Those with a GPMP, if you've done the initial GPMP, then you at least have to have done one review in the 12 months. If you were not the provider or the service that did the original GPMP, then you need to at least do two reviews in the 12 months to be financially remunerated. For the doctor, you know, the benefits, understanding the patient better because you're seeing them a little bit more often. Building rapport over time is really important. Um, and also understanding the patient context and just chipping away at issues rather than trying to deal with everything all at once, which can be quite overwhelming. So letting your registrar know that chipping away is okay. For the patient, the benefits of these may be it's around developing a trusting relationship with the doctor and the practice. And the hope is that there would be better, safer healthcare because one of the requirements to initially sign up for this is that you have to have two people in the service who have undertaken cultural awareness training. There are only a small list of exceptions to that. So generally two people have undertaken cultural awareness training, hoping that'll spike some interest in cultural safety training. The CTG co-payment Patient eligibility is anyone who identifies and only need to self-identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. The patient qualifies if the prescriber or an Aboriginal health practitioner feels that the patient would experience a setback, so if they wouldn't get their medication basically filled, and if they're unlikely to adhere to their medication without assistance, so without basically the medication being covered under the CTG. So to sign a patient up, you only need to sign a patient up once, and that came into effect 
this year and then they're signed up for lifelong. So patients who were signed up previously do not have to re-register and that, that was actually quite frustrating in the past having to chase patients up to get them to sign up for their CTG co-payment because sometimes it was hard to get patients to come in if they've got work or other commitments. The only time that it starts to become a little bit more urgent is when you need your medications and you're financially strapped. It is a one-off registration for patients with a healthcare card. Medications are free from the chemist. Of course, it's a funded program. If you do not have a healthcare card, then you pay the concession rate, which is, I think it's about $6. It does actually help patients with adherence to their medications, especially as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients are often on a large number of medications at a younger age, which can affect their financial freedom. I might just talk about what else might be out there for your patients that's worthwhile informing your registrar about if these are available. So we've already talked about the allied health referrals under the 715, so that's five visits. We've already talked about the follow-up item number after 715, which is 10 visits. That's with the practice nurse or the Aboriginal health worker or practitioner. We've talked about the CTG co-payment the immunisation schedule. Bear in mind that looks slightly different from state to state as well. So it might be useful to ensure that your registrar knows what the immunisation schedule is in other states, what is different when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Localised referral pathways are useful to know. So there might be antenatal services, shared care services, chronic disease management programs in your area. So in the Newcastle area, the PHN does the care coordination and supplementary services where you can get access to an Aboriginal health worker. Exercise physiologist, transport, appointment costs can be covered, um, medical equipment, and of course, patients have to qualify for those, but they are definitely things that do help patients manage their chronic disease and reduce barriers. Just bearing in mind that there will be things that are localised to your area and your context. So definitely make sure that you research that or even have your registrar research it and present it back as a learning opportunity. And I just want to say all of these are not entitlements. These are a way of closing the gap through equity. And the point here is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the whole are at a different starting point. So it's an issue of equity, not privilege. I'm always stumped with this because I don't do it frequently enough, but with the extra allied visits for 715, do we need to do an EPC for the extra five visits or is it, it just flows from the 715? Yeah, no. So there is another form that needs to be filled in. It's not an EPC form, but it is a different one. So there is another form and you you attach a referral letter stating yep. how many visits you would like to allocate. Many of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health courses the registrars undertake as part of workshop release activities cover some of this, but I think unless it's happening regularly, um, they just sort of lose touch with it. So it's absolutely important to refresh them, their practice in your role as a supervisor. Yeah, and always asking if this patient was Aboriginal, would that change what our recommendations are, how we would approach it, what we would do, what you know, what our management might be? Um, is there anything else that we would consider offering? This is just some of the resources on GPSA for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, so the teaching plans. So this is hopefully useful, but something that we definitely would like feedback on. If there's anything else that you'd like covered, anything that might be missing or anything that doesn't make sense. So I think that's really important, but definitely a good way for you to structure teaching for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Remembering that this is fairly generic which means it's not specific to your region. You may need to reach out to a cultural mentor in the region in which you're working and living to find out what's specific to the area the registrar needs to know. And 
for some of the change to the training program, there should be access to cultural mentors for both those doing RACGP training and those doing ACRAM training as well. So definitely reach out to them. Referring you to these resources, the ones that exist are the beginning of an expanding suite. They form part of the GPSA resource catalogue. We've got lots of team plans that you might be aware of in clinical and non-clinical areas. But very, very happy to have some in this particular area. And as Karen said, they're, you know, they're really very much a structured approach to covering some of these aspects of the practice. We know registrars are starting to use these a bit independently anyway to study from. So having a look together is very valuable, but certainly if you don't have an opportunity to look at them all, yeah, the registrars can just uh, use them in independently. And I think Karen's made a very good suggestion. If you think, gee, it'd be fabulous to have a fact sheet, a teaching plan on this particular aspect of practice, then let us know. It will fall to Karen to do the work, but um, she sounds like she's very keen to continue to produce these. Oh, I am. Definitely. Definitely. I think the last thing I would like to talk about, because I think this is actually really very important. It's not the only important thing, but I think it is very important, is actually about the language we use. So we talk about now talking about a strengths-based approach. So in the past, issues around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health or issues relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were talked about in what we refer to as the deficit discourse. And that's where we're referring to people or groups in terms of a deficiency, so such as an absence or a lack or a failure. So I think one thing that you can do as a supervisor for your registrar is change and challenge this narrative and role model, the strengths-based language and approach for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. I'll give you another example. It is important to know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are less likely to drink alcohol than other Australians. Those who do drink alcohol drink at more dangerous levels, but you are more likely to come across a non-drinker than a drinker in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Last week, that same patient that I was talking to, the GP had written in in a referral letter that the patient was a drinker and had drunk alcohol. And the patient read this and was actually really quite upset because they never drank alcohol. And so the doctor approached that consultation with their bias and that bias has come from many different sources, but didn't even uh, made an assumption that the, the patient was someone who drank alcohol. But what we know from the data and the surveys is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are less likely to drink alcohol. So talking about things in, in the strengths-based is really important. If we use the deficit discourse, it allows people to continue with their conscious and unconscious biases, and it can impact the care that they deliver, which is the example that I gave you. And, you know, strengths-based approach allows for a much more person-centred or patient-centred care, and it will help with building relationships if we acknowledge the resilience of our patients considering the trauma of that has been inflicted and that patients continue to experience. It's also about handing over a degree of power and responsibility in the consultation and creating a more level power dynamic taking the time to understand and respect the patient's background, values and needs. I mean, again, you'll find that there is definitely some strengths there that you can utilise as leverage in your consultation to negotiate, you know, health outcomes, whatever, whatever it is for the patient. It also helps with, you know, providing emotional support. Strengths-based allows us to be far more effective with communication. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tend to be much better at communicating on that one-on-one -on -one because they want to make a connection. It's part of the cultural way of being. It's actually quite a useful tool. So this document will give you just a little bit of information on strengths space that might be a little bit more relevant to programs, not just, not so much the general practice setting, but there's some principles in there that are definitely very relevant for general practice that I think is worthwhile. Karen, mini scenario here. I like to put to you, if that's okay, mm. 
So I struggle when patients self-label their deficiencies. For example, a patient recently talking about her DB relationship, she said it's in our culture. Felt my silence was somehow implicit agreement, but didn't know how to respectfully challenge this. I refocused her personal strength at getting through a lot of the challenges, but it didn't feel sufficient. You got a comment about how yep. to, to deal with that sort of scenario? And so, I mean, the first thing I would say, you know, domestic and family violence is never part of anyone's culture. It is a symptom of the intergenerational trauma. So that's definitely what I would do. How would you respond to it? I mean, yes, the silence, unfortunately, does imply you agree, unfortunately, but it doesn't mean you can't raise it with them if it's safe to and say, you know, I've been thinking about what you said and I'm... I actually don't agree. I don't think it is part of culture. I think it's far more of the historical concept. They may have been actually sounding you out as well to see whether or not you're prepared to engage in a conversation about this being around trauma. You know, domestic and family violence is a different situation. All you can do is have that real trauma-informed approach to mm. the patient and the consultation and care, but it is the time when the power, you know, giving the patient back the power is really, really important. That self-determination, that feeling mm. of control, I think is really important. Yeah. But you can respectfully disagree with someone, and I think that's okay, especially around these sorts of challenging issues mm. that we know are far more complex it's and a, it's certainly a hard hard area to navigate yeah and you know and, and even saying things like you know sometimes when we read the news or we look at the news it may seem like that's part of the culture but that's not my understanding you know yeah. my understanding that the culture is actually really very caring very supportive very inclusive this is a symptom my understanding is that this is a symptom of colonization and that intergenerational yeah. trauma yeah Thanks, Does that answer that question? I think you've covered that. I think it is that challenge of wanting to not challenge a patient's views, but on the other hand, not be seen to be agreeing with something that you feel some discomfort with. Yeah. It feels wrong for a non-Indigenous person to feel like I'm correcting her on her own view of culture. I think that's that's exactly right. Yeah, and I think bearing in mind that what is culture when you uh, belong to a group that is so disempowered and the images that is, are thrown back at that community or that group as to what you are, it's very easy to take that on board and mm. internalise it rather than the role modelling is constantly that deficit. It makes it very hard to actually see the strengths Thanks. in that. So, yeah. The idea of reframing it as a trauma response is useful. So thank you. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just some resources. This is an article that was published on yarning. So clinical yarn, worthwhile having a look at if you want. But there are a couple of those other resources I mentioned earlier. So we really hope you enjoyed this. Feedback is extremely important and very much valued. So please send back your honest feedback. Aaron, <laughs> so we would like to thank you. You talk about this aspect of practice with such authenticity and lived experience and not take so much away. So thank you so very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for letting me do it. And thank you everyone for participating. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'd love your feedback. Please comment or subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on new videos. If you'd like to ask a question or suggest a topic, you can contact us via our website at gpsa.org.au. GP Supervision Australia is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Training Program.